Hello everyone, uh, this is your host GB and welcome to 100 GB where I talk about software engineering, uh, technology, productivity, career and a lot of other random stuff I care about. So it has been a while and today this is gonna be the episode 2 in the clean code series. I'm not sure if you have seen the episode 1. If you haven't, the links are in the description below. Uh, just go and check it out. And so a, a little bit about the series. So the, the series is based on this book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. Well, the links to buy the book are in the description below. So I posted episode uh, 1 around 4 months back. And since then, frankly, I didn't get any time to post uh, episode 2 or any other video for that matter. Uh, but I have been posting like here and there. Well, let's leave all of that and let's jump into the content. All right, so, so episode two means chapter two, which is meaningful names. Well, names, I, I, I personally think this is like the most important or and most difficult problem in software engineering or programming. So if we talk about naming, what all kinds of names do we have? We have variable names, function names, class names, um, package names, directory names, and a ton of other names as well. And this is mostly what we are going to talk about today in this video. So the first thing that the author discusses is using intention revealing names. That the names should clearly reveal the intention of the author. What the author intends to do with, with that particular variable or class or function, whatever. Okay. Let's see for uh, example, uh, in the code over here. Uh, okay, So let's say I have this variable called int d uh, and I have a comment that says uh, elapsed time in uh, minutes. Well, uh, okay, that is fine for the definition of this uh, variable, but when this d is used somewhere in the code, let's say uh, int k equals d plus one. So the, the reader here is, practically uh, oblivious of the fact that D is in minutes and it reflects time. So how about like renaming your variable in such a way uh, elapsed time in minutes? I mean, it's pretty uh, descriptive and it shows the, uh, it kind of reflects my intent and the intent of the code as well. And now just uh, take a look at this function like pause this video over here for a minute and try to read this code. Now that you're back. Um, okay, so something weird is happening. Uh, we're creating a temporary list. Uh, we are iterating over uh, some global list. Uh, we are checking uh, if this particular variable, if some value in this variable is something and we are adding to this temporary uh, list and returning. So. Most likely we are filtering something. That that's what I can figure out from this code as a reader. Okay, now uh, let's say we replace this code or this code was uh, in this form. Okay, now uh, as a, from the reader's point of view, I can see that it's returning flagged cells. It creates a flagged cells temporary array. It iterates on the uh, so it basically gets every cell from the game board. It says if uh, this particular uh, value in the cell is a flagged value, then it's a flagged cell and I return the cell. Wow, it's effectively the same lines of code, but the code is so readable that reader doesn't have to look at any other part in the class. And it would have been even better if uh, instead of returning this int uh, array of int, uh, list of array of int, we uh, we have a new class that uh, basically reflects a cell. And since this, this particular logic is very specific to the cell, why not move it inside the cell class? So that's just a glimpse of what uh, I mean by, or what the author means by uh, revealing your intentions. Okay, so the other thing author talks about is avoiding misinformation. So let's say you have a group of users you want to represent in the code and you uh, basically have a variable named users list or user list, whatever. But the moment you insert this list keyword in the name, it, it's 
it, it kind of, uh, from the reader's point of view, it kind of tells me that it's a list, as in the data structure is some kind of list. But it effectively is a group of users, and it can be a list, it can be a map, it can be a tree. It's effectively a collection, right? So, you should avoid misinformation and in this particular case, instead of having user list, you could have just had uh, users or user group or bunch of users or whatever. So, well, the next thing that the author talks about is meaningful distinction. So let's say you have this, uh, okay, let's write down a quick method. Okay. Well, like the major problem is you don't know what is the source and this and the destination, right? Which is the like the primary uh, use case of this function. So why not have it like this? Source and destination. If the uh, reader of the code wants to edit the code somewhere inside this function, they are very clear that, okay, this is the source and this is the destination. They're good to go. Well, next, the names should be pronounceable and searchable. So what the author means by pronounceable names is, so let's say we have this class called, okay, account statement record 105. And there is this member variable, uh, which is which is a date, uh, which is gen dd uh, and another date which is mod dd mmy by. Uh, okay, from the reader's perspective, I don't know what they mean, but uh, okay, there is this UID, which is 105. Okay, I don't know it's, if it's a user ID uh, or if it's the ID of this record. Now let's have a modified version of it which clearly says account statement record. So think of it like if I had this class and I want to search it in my IDE, I, I cannot, as a reader, I cannot. But uh, given I have the name of the class uh, in this form, I can easily search for it. So uh, it, it's, it kind of overlaps into the intention revealing thing as well. Uh, I mean, it clearly reveals the intention of the author. Let's come to the variable names as well. So this is this gen DDMM by by it's so weird. Uh, the reader has no idea what it means unless uh, like they look into the code. So and over here it clearly says it's the generation timestamp of this particular record. And this one is a modification timestamp. So another aspect to the searchable names. We have this function called get tasks. Yeah, there is some local variable. It does some magic divides by two first divides by uh, five then and returns this. So the reader has no idea what what is happening in this code. Now let's see uh, like the modified version of this code with effectively the same lines of code. Let's leave this. Okay, we are iterating from zero to number of tasks. And we, so there is this array called uh, task estimate in units. For every task, we have uh, the number of units required to uh, kind of do the task and we have the number of units that can be done in in a day so for every task it gets the estimated units it divides by the it divides by the uh, like the number of units that can be done per day and that's that's how it gets the number of days and uh, since it's a five days week uh, it divides the days by five and returns total weeks and it's, it's effectively the same code. It's just the naming magic and you, uh, and the reader gets to understand the code just by looking at this function. Wow. Uh, so let's say we are building this Delhi, Delhi Wala chart application. And for every class in this application, we, uh, we are having this prefix called DWC, which effectively means Delhi Wala chart. And now it becomes weird. So we, I have DWC customer, DWC order, DWC message, DWC foobar. Why are we working against the IDE and against all of the tooling that we have? Because like, whenever I have to search for uh, this particular class, I'll have to write DWC. Why? I mean, okay, most IDEs have these days, uh, uh, like they do string matching from any index, but still. I mean, there is no point in having this uh, 
and in a, in a very big application where you have multiple modules, even then it doesn't make any sense because most likely uh, the classes will be in their respective directory and packages. So even for searching, if you want to distinguish, you should be fine in most of the IDEs. So next, the author talks about avoiding mental mapping. So this mental mapping uh, is mostly the kind of the mapping inside uh, the, the author's head, as in the code author's head. Uh, so let's say I'm writing this code and I uh, I have variables i, j, and k, and I'm I'm using those inside of a loop. It's most likely fine because every software engineer or programmer starts with writing loops in the form of i, j, and k. But then introducing more variables, let's say r and l, will make life miserable for the reader because they effectively don't know and they don't have the mapping for l and r, and that is the difference between kind of a professional programmer and a regular programmer per se, uh, that they know that clarity is the king. Next, what about class names? So uh, think about this. So generally, this, this book is mostly structured around Java. And uh, the recommendation for the class names is that they should be noun phrase, noun as in, in Hindi, we call it Sangya. Uh, and there is a very I still remember the definition of a uh, noun. Kisi bhi vyakti vastu jati sthan ya bhav ke naam ko sangya kehte hain. So you know what, what a noun is. Let's say a customer, home, uh, record, object, person, human, whatever. Your method name. Well, methods, you know what methods are. These are effectively actions. And by action, we mean verb. So yeah, a function should be, should ideally be a verb. Like do this, do that, get me this, set this. You understood, you got the point. One very important thing that the author talks about is pick one word per concept, which is actually so important. Like I've personally read a lot of code, uh, both open source and here and there. And this is kind of a, like the primary problem that I face. Like in a lot of classes, uh, we generally see that we have this get function, we have this retrieve function, we have this fetch function, and we don't know what's, what's the difference between these three. So <laughs> the recommendation is use one term and be consistent. I mean, it'll help readers a lot. Another thing that the author mentions is using computer science terms. If, if you think about it, it's a natural way of writing code because see, the code is meant to be read by software engineers, right? Uh, who, who are very well aware of algorithmic terms, mathematic terms, for example, let's say I have some class that says account adapter or some adapter. Well, for a software engineer who is reading that code, in a jiffy of a moment, he'll know that, okay, this is something which has to do something with the adapter pattern. Okay, in case you don't know what an adapter pattern is, just Google it out and it's very simple. It's a very basic, uh, you know, design pattern. Summarizing all of this, uh, well, <laughs> In my terms, what I think is what we are trying to do here is we are optimizing for the worst case, which software engineers always do, right? So here we are optimizing for the worst, worst case and the worst case here is the readers, the reading of the code. So see, if you are in a startup where you are the only one in the dev team, most likely you are okay. You just write code once, uh, I mean multiple times, but uh, it, it's gonna be only you who will be reading that code. So it, over there you have to optimize for yourself and things are generally good. But if you're talking about some like big organization where you have hundreds of engineers and where the, the life of the code is let's say five, 10, 15, 20 years, then you have to optimize for the reading because the code is then written once and it's, it's, it's read by like hundreds or maybe thousands of engineers in the next 10 or 15 years time frame. And if the code is written poorly, it's gonna affect every single reader. And that is what you are optimizing for. And that is what this episode two is all about. So the major takeaway is your code should read like sentences and paragraphs. The most natural code. <laughs> Okay, so this was it, folks. I hope you liked the video um, and I'm slowly getting back to track. And maybe you are finding the quality of the camera a little bit better than before because it is, I have upgraded. So see you in the next one and happy coding, bye.